Hi, everyone. I think we'll get started. Um, welcome to MIT InnoTherm. I'm Evelyn Wang, one of the organizers for this colloquia series. Today, um, this is our 19th uh, InnoTherm colloquium, and the focus will be on alternative refrigerants. And I'd like to introduce the moderator for this session, who is Professor Stefan Elbel who is a research assistant professor at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign in the Mechanical Science and Engineering Department. He is also the Associate Director of Air Conditioning and Refrigeration Center, as well as a Chief Engineer at Creative Thermal Solutions. You can see his active role in a lot of different professional societies and his research interests very much aligned to the topic of this colloquium. In particular, his interests include experimental and numerical research in thermodynamics, fluid mechanics, and heat transfer, the fundamental applied research on the components and systems used for mobile, residential, commercial, industrial heating and cooling systems, and energy, energy conversion systems with the specialization in sustainable vapor compression technology using synthetic and natural low GWP refrigerants. So please welcome me, uh, please join me in welcoming Professor Elbel. Thank you, Professor Wang, for the kind introduction, and uh, also welcome everybody to this uh, InnoTherm uh, Colloquium on Alternative Refrigerants. It is my great pleasure to introduce um, our two exceptional speakers today, and uh, the first one is Professor Pega Herniak. Um, I've known uh, Pega for 20 years. We have been working uh, very closely together for the past 20 years, and uh, he is currently the Stuck, uh, faculty fellow and distinguished research professor and also the director of the Air Conditioning and Refrigeration Center at uh, University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. He's also the founder and president of uh, Creative Thermal Solutions. And uh, then you see comes Pega's very long list of awards. I'm afraid we don't have all the time to go through all of these awards, but I can assure you Pega has won everything there is to win in our field. Um, his research interests, uh, you can see his contributions um, in energy conversion systems, focused on microchannel heat exchangers, and then of course on uh, all kinds of refrigerants, um, natural and synthet synthetic options um, with really all of the applications they are from space, air, automotive, stationary, and, uh, and so forth. Um, if you could switch slides, please. Um, then I would also like to introduce uh, our second speaker equally exceptional. Uh, Dr. Bob Lowe from uh, Cura Global, uh, located in the, in the UK. You see that um, Bob is also the research director of Mexican Fluor, um, which is really the same company. So you see Bob is so good, he can easily fill two positions at the same company. Um, Bob's background is in chemical engineering. He holds a PhD from University of Edinburgh. And uh, you see that uh, throughout his career, he was uh, involved with uh, refrigerant uh, developments. His specialties are refrigeration applications, especially the mathematical modeling side of the properties, and then also um, the chemical reaction engineering. Um, next slide, please. Um, just to tell you a little bit about the agenda today, how we have organized um, our, our seminar. Um, we have approximately 45 minutes time for the presentations. Um, Pega will begin with um, a general overview and background uh, about the topic. Um, then Bob will continue with uh, an in-depth perspective on fluorinated uh, refrigerants and alternatives. And then Pega will come back and um, give us more information and background on natural refrigerants. Um, if we stay on time, um, we should have approximately 30 minutes for hopefully a very lively discussion. We hope that you will be able to participate in the discussion. Um, so please um, submit your questions using the Q&A button. You should see on your screen on the, on the bottom there. Um, we will pulling the, the questions from that stream. Um, we um, see all of the questions. You, if you type the questions, will only be able to see your own questions. Um, so don't be surprised if you don't see too many questions uh, while the seminar is going on. Um, also, we welcome uh, any suggestions you have for future topics and speakers, and we'll uh, talk about that again uh, during the wrap up. Um, just a reminder, the colloquium is being recorded and will be posted on YouTube so you can watch again and again. Um, and uh, we'll also post uh, the questions that we maybe don't get to today if uh, there's too many of them. Um, also, there's a possibility if you would like to ask anonymously, um, you just have to state that in your question and uh, we'll do so. So without further ado, um, I uh, welcome you again and uh, give the ball to Pega, um, who will start. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Stefan. Uh, I'm starting with the first slide here basically uh, what, uh, what I will tell you. 
uh, when we see alternative refrigerants uh, in the title, the first logical question is uh, a definition. What are refrigerants and why alternatives? Uh, I will not uh, be talking about uh, all refrigerants. And uh, in, in a sense, we could think that gadolinium in magnetic refrigeration is refrigerant or elastomeris uh, could be also used as refrigerants. But I will be talking about uh, material that is uh, typically fluid that helps in moving heat uh, uh, from lower to higher temperature. And what is alternative? Alternative is a potential replacement to a mainstream conventional something that is used today. So, and then the question is why we do that? Uh, oops. Uh, as I said, refrigerants uh, are the function of refrigeration method. We'll be focused today mostly on a vapor compression systems. And uh, it is shown uh, on the right, uh, uh, kind of the, 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 the most uh, used uh, refrigeration uh, system of today, probably 99% of uh, uh, refrigeration capacity is uh, achieved by this uh, relatively simple uh, uh, type of a system. Of course, we have air systems with air as a refrigerant, water systems, and I have noticed that somebody had already asked that kind of question, will we be talking about that? Uh, not too much. Uh, steam ejector systems, which is also, all of them are vapor compression systems uh, as shown uh, here in, in a blue shaded art. Uh, we, could, uh, we could talk about uh, refrigerants in absorption systems or adsorption systems. And I think uh, next week, uh, 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 Professor Garimella will be talking about absorption systems or sorption in general. And then there are other niche applications uh, like uh, 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 magnetic, uh, acoustic, thermoelectric, electrochemical, all sorts of uh, uh, options. I need to go through, okay. So we will be focused today on refrigerants used in vapor compression systems that, that we can divide them, as Stefan has said, into synthetic or, or kind of found in nature. And we will also talk about single component refrigerants mostly but also about blends or mixtures of various refrigerants uh, to the, the uh, goal, goal of these uh, mixtures and blends is to achieve some characteristics that cannot be found in any single component. Uh, and that today it is uh, mostly when you have some uh, uh, kind of okay performing refrigerant, but uh, with a relatively low GWP and you put a very good refrigerant with high GWP you are making a blend to get something in between, something acceptable and good performing. And we will uh, mention kind of very arbitrary uh, division to low, medium, high pressure refrigerants on applications that are based on, uh, oops, uh, applications that are based, sorry about this, applications that are based uh, on, um, uh, um, on temperature, like, uh, ultra low, low, um, uh, medium, and then very high, and so on. Uh, all of that is because we are trying to identify good alternatives for a certain application, typically served by a specific uh, conventional refrigerant. Struggling to move. Why are we looking into alternatives? Because something, as I said, isn't, uh, isn't right with the ma mainstream. Uh, over time, whenever we are using something, we, we learn uh, about the negative impacts. And uh, so was with refrigerants. First, uh, uh, ozone depletion uh, activity had been uh, realized. And now we want uh, ozone depletion potential to be zero. And global warming potential uh, GWP to be as low as possible because uh, we have seen that uh, uh, refrigerants with its uh, very high global warming potential can uh, affect um, the, the, the climatic situation on Earth. Uh, but uh, there is, a, we always need to know that there is a reason why mainstream refrigerants became mainstream. That is because they have a good properties, provided good solution for the system, relatively cost effective. And that selection was very logical. It happened over a long time. 
so uh, what are these desired properties? Uh, we want to have an alternative that is non-toxic. This is ASHA category A, non-flammable. We would prefer ASHA category B to have an, and we will see that uh, new refrigerants are maybe not there. Uh, and uh, uh, we want a good some material compatibility, interaction with some common construction material, corrosion, not only, interaction with elastomeric lubricant. And uh, some people be believe that uh, there is a possibility to have a drop-in replacement refrigerants, which I would disagree. Whenever you have, even in the best scenario, if you, if you just uh, charge uh, existing um, uh, system with a new refrigerant, uh, the performance will be suboptimal. And then the question is, what is that uh, good performance? Good performance is typically, uh, we are talking about efficiency or COP of that, uh, that system and capacity, of course. So how to evaluate efficiency when using new refrigerant? Some people very e easy say efficient refrigerant, which I would uh, uh, disagree with that. It is not so easy. We probably mean high COP, but they don't typically don't specify of what. Typically COP of the cycle is used as a first measure. And this is because it is relatively simple and it is clean because we use uh, tools of thermodynamics. And, but uh, uh, it is overly simplistic, it should be. Uh, COP of the cycle, but it is very difficult at the beginning to define it because we don't know uh, what are the components and how to optimize these components. So now we are entering into less simple or less clean metrics because we need to think about compressor efficiency, heat transfer or effectiveness of heat exchanger, even complexity of the system, whether there are internal heat exchangers, improved expansion devices like ejector, expander, are these uh, uh, multi-stage or single-stage uh, uh, cycle systems and so on? Let's, let me give you the example of what I mean when I say that, uh, because I believe that some, some people may, 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 may like this. Uh, uh, when we look into cycles, we, we could start from a Carnot cycle, ideal cycle as uh, shown here. Uh, and of course, COP is, uh, what we get, Q evaporation, divided by what we put in at work. And uh, what is uh, very interesting to say in this uh, Carnot cycle, ideal cycle, uh, all the fluids are equal. So basically there is no reason to use a Carnot cycle when comparing the refrigerants alternative to something that is mainstream. But when, you, when we move to something more realistic like Rankine cycle, or reverse ranking cycle, then things start to look a little bit different. Then we see, uh, we, we move in ranking cycle to a dry uh, suction, and then we have a, a, a superheated the compressor discharge, and we move from a expander to a valve to a, a relatively simple uh, isentalpic expansion to reduce the cost of the system, and then Refrigerants are not equal, but this is far from really going into realistic systems. Realistic systems are um, supposed to be presented here. This in the black, this is a uh, ranking cycle as we have presented in the last slide. But if we look into the cycle, the system, sorry, then we are introducing heat exchangers, condenser here and evaporator here. So we are cooling the uh, evaporation uh, temperature lower because we need to overcome uh, the temperature difference. And the same is we are pushing the uh, uh, condensing temperature or pressure higher to again overcome the, um, uh, the, the, the resistances in heat exchanger. Uh, compressor isn't uh, isentropic anymore, but it has some realistic uh, uh, isentropic efficiency. Now, I haven't shown all details of the suction and the discharge. It will be too much. So this is what is a difference. So suddenly, if you look into the efficiency or COP of this uh, system, it will look 
much worse. And it will have what is the most uh, important, it will have here unknown effects of unknown heat exchanger or compressor efficiency. So that is that uh, difficulty when we go to a realistic uh, system. So if we want to look into, into use of uh, alternative refrigerant, we could start from ideal Rankine versus Carnot as presented here. And we are here looking into uh, a single stage, but we could have all sorts of either two stage or all sorts of uh, improvements in the cycle. So we are here going to the simplest possible. Now, if we go to any other um, improvement of the cycle, that is increasing complexity, increasing the cost, but of course, efficiency would go up and that change will be affected differently for different uh, refrigerants. And then we go, when we go from um, ideal ranking into the actual cycle, to actual system, and then we go to, let's say here presented in a, in a let's say vehicle where we have uh, issues of non-uniformities of uh, velocity, air uh, velocity profile, and, um, and uh, to also non-uniformities of temperature profile, usage, climatic data, and all of that, it is obviously that is extremely uh, difficult and unreliable to predict the performance of any refrigerants looking just at the simple thermodynamic efficiency as uh, many people would like to do. So it is way complex and that is why there have been many surprises. And this is opportunity for good engineers to present what they know, especially for young engineers because they can, uh, uh, can, can, uh, can see their future. When evaluating the goodness of potential of alternative refrigerants, we always need to look into thermodynamics as I have shown in thermophysical properties, but I will uh, show you a little bit of thermodynamic properties, how just a sim simple um, uh, kind of uh, scale issues could mislead uh, us sometimes. So there, here are uh, four refrigerants that uh, we, we will typically present them that way. 134A, ammonia, carbon dioxide, and propane. They look very similar. Well, we see that uh, carbon dioxide and ammonia have a very high discharge temperatures. Of course, there is some thermodynamic loss for that, but less or more, they look all the same. The moment when you present these uh, refrigerants in scale, things look so much different. Look at how large is uh, the uh, vapor, uh, the, 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 the latent heat of vaporization in ammonia compared to dismal performance of uh, uh, CO2. Look at how much losses uh, we have here uh, in expansion uh, only in, in CO2 compared to let's say uh, excellent uh, ammonia, very good uh, um, uh, propane and decent uh, 134A. But if we present that in a P uh, H uh, uh, diagrams, then it, it is even more interesting because it, in front of our eyes, we can see the difference in uh, compressor uh, uh, needs in the, in the seat in the CO2 compared to uh, all other refrigerants. So compressors for CO2, besides other components, have to be very different if you want to have a good, uh, good performance. So uh, at this point, I will stop here and give, uh, give the screen to uh, Dr. Bob Lowe to tell you more about uh, synthetic uh, refrigerants and made refrigerants. Thank you, Pega. So I hope now everybody can see my screen and uh, I shall just take a few minutes now to talk about some of the development directions that are taking place in uh, fluorinated refrigerant development. So why am I here? Why not some other guy? Uh, well, I've been working in the refrigeration business since I 
uh, completed my PhD, which is 30 years ago now. And in fact, my PhD was on the design of zeotropic refrigerants in novel heat pump cycles for capturing renewable energy. So uh, I've been at the game since 1986, as it turns out. And I've worked in that time on refrigerant process design and refrigerant development and uh, process technology development. And you can see my company used to be part of the ICI group and we've been making refrigerants in the UK since the 1950s and in the uh, Americas since 1992. Uh, so we know what's going on and we are actively developing new refrigerants even today. So I'm going to just share some of my thoughts about where we're going in development direction. So as Peg has talked about already, uh, it's actually societal needs that drive refrigerant evolution. If there's no need to change, nothing will change. Uh, if we look, the development of CFCs in the 1920s was actually driven by an emerging mass demand for air conditioning, comfort cooling and refrigeration. At the time, the engineering was not as good as it is today. Leakages were assumed to be inevitable. And the fluids that were used as refrigerants were too hazardous to be safely used in domestic or end use appliances. You know, ethyl chloride, ammonia, sulfur dioxide and, and hydrocarbons, for example. So the CFCs were seen as solving the problems of flammability and toxicity. But of course, in the 70s, it was realized that ozone depletion was a, a real problem. And that actually drove the transition uh, as a societal need away from the chlorine containing refrigerants, which were excellent thermodynamic tools, but they the environmental damage uh, via the Montreal Protocol, still the most successful international treaty ever negotiated. And that led, amongst other things, for a very rapid adoption of R134A for mobile air conditioning and blends of HFCs, uh, hydrofluorocarbons in stationary applications. Although it wasn't so much noticed at the time, the transition from CFCs also gave a huge potential uh, benefit in reducing the global warming potential of refrigerants, typically from about 10,000 down to about 2,000. Now, as we move on further, we realise that man-made climate change is an issue, and that is driving up a need for further reduction in refrigerant GWP. But it's often forgotten, I think, lost in the rush that actually you have to keep the system efficiency high. If you reduce the GWP, but the system is less efficient, overall, it has been driven at some point by some uh, energy source that causes fossil gas to be emitted. Uh, and that means that you will still emit uh, CO2 into the atmosphere. So why do we need fluorine? Well, there are other options which don't contain fluorine, for example, the hydrocarbons, carbon dioxide or ammonia. And for some applications, these are excellent. And they've always been excellent in those applications. Uh, I would note in passing, although they occur in nature, they're all industrial synthesized. And indeed, when I was part of ICI, we made all of these materials at scale in large chemical plant. Uh, so they're industrially made, but naturally occurring. But if you look at where they can't easily go, there are still application gaps where you need to add fluorine to the refrigerant to get the balance of properties you require. Uh, and bearing in mind most applications, the evaporator temperature would be minus 40 C to plus 5 C. Uh, the condenser temperature would be normally against air, uh, 20 to 60 Celsius. So uh, 100 to 150 Fahrenheit condensing temperature. Uh, what does fluorine do? It modifies the properties of the organic backbone. The most notable headline result is that it will affect the flammability of the molecule, giving you non flammable fluids and so on. But it also gives some benefits by increasing heat capacity, which is helpful for keeping compressors cool enough to run without burning the oil. And the polarity of the refrigerant will also interact with lubricants and give you miscible transportable uh, mixtures that can flow around systems. And there's a th third benefit, you can also get features like hesiotropy, so mixtures of refrigerants that behave as a single fluid. Uh, how does fluorine make it such a dramatic difference? Well, it messes with the polarity of the molecules. So methane is a non-polar molecule, almost a perfect gas, can't really be used for mass market refrigeration and of course, very, very flammable. But difluoromethane, almost the same molecule, uh, boiling point now puts it very much useful and it's used in fact for air conditioning. Uh, I mentioned before that GWP is not the only measure we have in environmental impact, but it's one of the simplest ones to code and regulation. Uh, if you look at the typical pattern of energy consumption with a vapor compression system, even in a leaky application, as historically car air conditioning leaked quite 
high proportions of refrigerant charge. The fuel consumption to drive the system would typically be four times the greenhouse gas emission over the life of the car compared to the refrigerant leakage. So when we're looking at trying to develop alternative refrigerants, yes, we're pushing for minimizing GWP, but we have to keep an eye on energy efficiency. Uh, Peggy's comment about good engineering made me uh, remember that we always have to point out that simple engineering always needs attention to leak tight systems can't emit greenhouse gases. So good leakage, good performance, better seals, better design, lower charge sizes will get benefits just as much as all of the work that a chemical company might do in developing a refrigerant. And the other point about GWP is although it's a good metric of progress, some applications, for example, those where compressors could run very hot, you need to inc include some fluorine to keep the compressor cool enough to be functional. And that is why, for example, in the regulation designed in the European Union, the phase down scheme doesn't limit all applications just on GWP. It instead limits the total amount of greenhouse gas that can be used. And that gives some flexibility where it's needed. So how do you solve this GWP? How do you make an alternative refrigerant? I said before, it's the, it's the uh, <clears throat> feature of the compound that it gives stability by adding fluorine. That stability uh, gives a long atmospheric life in terms of several years, typically for HFCs. Very fast compared to CO2, but the heat trapping capacity per molecule is higher, and that's why the GWP is higher. Only two ways to reduce the GWP of refrigerant, blend high GWP with low GWP fluid like CO2, or change the chemistry of the molecules so that there's enough reactivity to let them break down outside in the atmosphere whilst not reacting inside in the system. And we see now both approaches are being used by people developing refrigerants. We're now in a stage of transition again, we're in divergent evolution, people are trying out ideas. Uh, some of these will survive, others will fall by the wayside. Uh, and the way we achieve this reactivity is we either go for very light degree of fluorination, I mentioned before difluoromethane, it's flammable, uh, whereas the perfluoromethane R14 is completely non-flammable. Uh, or you can go for using a, an unsaturated molecule, tetrafluoropropene 1234YF, for example, is now used extensively. And it's also flammable, but it's very weakly flammable. And the key here is balancing flammability and reactivity against stability and suitability. Uh, the so-called ASHRAE 2L class fluids, although they're flammable in the test apparatus, they're very difficult to ignite in practice. And that means you can use more of them in a system safely and the consequences of ignition or the likelihood of ignition can be mitigated more easily. So if we look at what is available and what people are working right now, there is actually not a universe of chemical compounds that are possible refrigerant components. The toolkit is quite small. And I try to show here in the toolkit that we're looking at a family of about maybe 20 molecules that could be used to make refrigerants refrigerant blends. And if you consider the application range for the vapor compression cycle uh, in its simplest form, typically runs from about minus 80 Celsius to uh, condensing conditions at maybe plus 50 Celsius. Uh, you can look at the family of fluids we have. We have CO2, uh, difluoroethylene, fluoromethane, trifluoromethane, perfluoromethane, and so on on the left. And then over on the right, we have more complicated looking molecules, which are fluorinated propylenes and butylenes over here, so 1233ZD is chlorotrifluoropropylene, for example, and 1336 is a hexafluorobutylene. Uh, not all of the compounds are what, what we call ideal in terms of safety. The safest classification in ASHRAE is A1, low toxicity, non clonable uh, Many of the fluids that are low GWP, as you see here in green, are flammable, so 2, 2L, or 3 numbers, and a couple are also toxic. Well, the toxicity here is chronic. Uh, it's important to differentiate between toxicity on release, which would be acute toxicity, and chronic toxicity. Ammonia is acutely toxic on release, but also chronically toxic, uh, whereas 1130E, for example, is chronically toxic, but not acutely toxic. Ideally, though, you want an A rating. So you can see the 20 or so numbers. If you think of a feasible refrigerant blends can be between two and four components, actually, you don't need to be remembering all your statistics classes to know that gives you quite a lot of combinatorial possibilities. And that's what people are using now. So this evolution that we have driven initially by the focus in GWP also gives you a chance to change your technology. 
Some of the changes we've seen have been driven by a pure regulatory driver. For example, replacing a 134A for car, car air conditioning with 1234YF. The European regulation timescale meant a near lookalike fluid was the only option that could really be considered. Likewise, if you consider long-lasting equipment like supermarket refrigeration, where a typical store in America or the EU will be 15 to 20 years active life, uh, if you've got a store that's got 15 years life in it, left in it, retrofitting to an intermediate refrigerant uh, makes good economic sense, but it also makes good environmental sense. Rather than waiting 20 years to put a new build system with very low GDP in, you can convert relatively easily and get good environmental gains. So sometimes people go for fluids that are just quite like the fluids they have today. But in other cases, you can actually take the chance to design a better combination of fluid and technology. And we see some of that happening now. Uh, so for example, you can change the pressure level. You can change the thermodynamic cycle. You can use what fluid with so-called high glide, a large difference in temperature as it evaporates or condenses. And we see that developers are using the ingredients in some quite interesting ways. And I've just name checked a few here. Honeywell are using an iodine compound, R13 I1, to make not 32 non flammable, for example. Uh, Kimurs have used uh, what was previously thought of just as an industrial solvent, dichloroethylene, to make actually a very thermodynamically attractive refrigerant for their building air conditioning. Asahi Glass are testing trifluoroethylene as a blend. We're using difluoroethylene, which is the raw material to make a fluoropolymer in a blend design. And people are already designing blends of HFO materials and 32, for example, for air conditioning. So what's the difference between a rapid timescale, you must change regulatory driver and a more leisurely technology driver? You can see here an example. 134 had to be changed for new build cars in the EU. That was the regulatory driver. The timescale meant the simplest evolutionary solution one, 1234YF, thermodynamically similar. Uh, there were other interesting fluids where the technology was developed to readiness, but the complexity meant they were not adopted. But if you look to the same notional application cars, but now consider the demands of an electric vehicle, electric vehicle doesn't have air conditioning anymore, it does thermal management to condition the battery and to keep the passengers not just cool, but warm in the winter. And people are already developing not one solution, but four solutions. Four, four different technologies all look feasible for this application. Which one will win? It's too early to say, but they will all technically do the job. And that gives efficient designers some interesting possibilities to work with technology designers to offer better overall results. Uh, just to finish, uh, I've got a couple of examples of how we are trying to hybridize. Uh, I said before that uh, from my chemical engineer's perspective, all refrigerants are made industrially. It's a matter of uh, property characteristics rather than where they come from, it's of interest to us. Uh, we've been looking for some time now at uh, developing a, a refrigerant for a very low temperature application. Uh, when we're talking typically about cold space temperatures in the range of minus 60, minus 85 Celsius. Uh, and you'll have seen a lot of talk about minus 80 Celsius recently for vaccine refrigeration, for example. The refrigerants used for this application in the non flammable ones are typically of very high global warming potential, almost 15,000. You can't use CO2 because it freezes at minus 57. You can use ethane for small systems like lab freezers, but bigger units, you need to have a non flammable fluid. So we've actually done quite a lot of work on hybridizing CO2 with HFCs and HFOs to try to get the best of both worlds solution, and we, we think we've done it. We've uh, got a fluid that's got a GWP below 2000. Uh, it's actually 60% CO2, uh, but in terms of thermodynamics, it works very well. And we, we know we can run it down to minus 70, minus 75 C before we really see dry ice formation. Uh, so that's a good example of how, if you just let yourself think of a different way of doing it, neither purely synthetic nor purely naturally occurring, you can actually get a good result. Uh, and we're also working on a similar concept where we looked at using CO2, which is used in a transcritical cycle, and Peggy's going to talk a little bit more about that. Many advantages for an end user in CO2, flammability, non-flammable, cost, GWP, but the transcritical cycle limits the efficiency. And we have been doing some work on hybridizing by mixing just enough fluorine into the CO2 to make it a bit more efficient and a bit less stressful for the compressor. 
And what we're doing is pushing on a Mollier diagram the left hand side of the cycle further over so that we can get more useful refrigeration for the same volume of gas pumped through the compressor. Simple concept, but it seems to work. So what will the future hold? Uh, I think the future will hold interesting developments with existing materials. Uh, I've said before, before, refrigerant development is not a single optimization, it's a multivariable optimization. In fact, you're often trying to minimize one feature and maximize another feature simultaneously. So you don't have a simple unconstrained optimization. Really, the goal is to get a better environmental impact. And the solutions will depend very much on the application. Never mind what refrigerant is historically used. Application needs may uh, drive a, an evolution of maybe two or three refrigerants to replace a single refrigerant. I said before, the molecules are already largely known. Uh, actually, the team at NIST did excellent work in rigorously modelling all feasible molecules and showed that there was a palette of about 30. But even with only a limited palette, you can still create paintings, you can still be art artistic, and that's what people are doing. Uh, and all I would say is, as long as there is a pressure for change or improvement, we can expect refrigerant evolution to continue. So with that, I'll uh, finish my piece and hand back to Pega. So, uh, Bob, let's uh, continue uh, the uh, talk. Let me go where we stopped. So basically, uh, I'll go to those uh, fluids that are found in nature, just a little bit of examples, and I will try to make it now faster. We are going a little bit uh, longer than... Uh, uh, than we planned. So the objective is to provide an overview from the point uh, of a mechanical engineer. The emphasis of most potential for research and activities um, uh, to, to think about what, what to do in your labs. As I said earlier, refrigerants are the function of refrigeration method and we will be focused mostly on those, hydrocarbons, carbon dioxide and ammonia. And if we start quickly, uh, Ammonia is the only refrigerant that have been uh, uh, continuously in use, and I'll say that. So basically, it has ODP zero and GWP zero. Uh, it has very high latent heat, low mass flow rate, excellent heat transfer characteristics, but it is smelly, mildly toxic. Uh, good, uh, good, uh, good uh, characteristic is that it is very smelly. So even it, at a very low concentration, it is very difficult to uh, to withstand it. So it is self-alarming. It's mildly flammable, but really mildly flammable. There are some incompatibilities with material, uh, but uh, as I said, uh, regardless of all of these uh, problems, this is the only natural refrigerant that is continuously used in industrial refrigeration. And uh, in US, probably over 90% of industrial refrigeration is done with, uh, with ammonia. So the question is whether this is alternative refrigerant at all. Uh, yes, it could be seen as alternative refrigerant if we go to these opportunities, like to go to large charge chillers, uh, low charge, excuse me, chillers uh, for air conditioning or refrigeration, uh, or some systems with the secondary coolant or cascade, industrial heat pumps. What is actually needed here to be done? Uh, low charge heat exchangers are number one, and we have long time ago gone into micro channels and uh, further uh, improvements in that direction is, uh, is uh, needed. Uh, hermetic compressors and similar stuff. But let's go to carbon dioxide uh, where I intend to give you some examples of uh, kind of more from, again, mechanical engineering, uh, me mechanical engineers point of view. Uh, it is already attracted attention. It, it is as uh, uh, Bob had mentioned, it has an excellent uh, heat transfer characteristics because its uh, properties and uh, uh, it, uh, it is uh, not uh, B uh, type of fluid, but uh, it, it cannot uh, allow more than 4% of carbon dioxide uh, to be in the, in the room where people are uh, uh, sitting. Some people see the high pressure as an issue. I think it is uh, relatively easy to handle because it's a relatively uh, easy technically uh, uh, to solve. Uh, significant expansion losses reduce usefulness of already small latent heat. That is basically mean cycles improvement. And, um, 
uh, in applications. It is excellent for low temperature applications as Bob already mentioned, transcritical over 25. I don't know whether this is pro or not, but just to let you know, uh, critical temperature is 32.2, but when your air is at roughly 25, you are already in, uh, in a transcritical operation. Uh, and uh, then you would uh, kind of uh, uh, need to adjust the control uh, of the system and so on. Uh, requires uh, very different components than conventional system. The, that way it is uh, uh, more expensive uh, when we, uh, oops, I am not in a presentation mode. Um, hmm. Apologize. It is uh, requires different components. Uh, so, uh, 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 I'd like to give you one illustration of how bad was uh, initial uh, expectations or simplistic uh, uh, evaluation of uh, carbon dioxide as a low uh, efficiency refrigerant. This is what would be uh, if we look into TS, what would be the comparison between carbon dioxide, which is this uh, lower dome and 134A and their cycles when operating between zero and uh, 40 degrees C. Uh, analysis here, simple analysis, uh, tell us that we would expect 40% lower COP without internal heat exchanger. But when we could uh, build the system with equal size of identical size, almost of a heat exchangers out, outside and, uh, uh, and, um, um, and extended surface, uh, we have gotten very different, uh, very different uh, performance. Here is only addition of internal heat exchanger. So you see in the blue is a 134A cycle and everything the same. This is air inlet and air outlet on the evaporator cooling air on the evaporator. And this here is uh, air on the condenser. That means almost identical, a little bit higher uh, capacity of CO2 for the same situation. And the question is, why is that? Mostly it is because in 134A, condensing temperature and thus the pressure to which a compressor is compressing is a, a much higher than the exit from the gas cooler. So the gas cooler in the same size is a much more effective approach temperature difference is 0 0.5, one degree C. And with uh, uh, internal heat exchanger, we are going very much uh, more to the left side, uh, gaining, uh, gaining refrigeration effect here. So basically making our evaporator uh, much more, um, much uh, better with greater capacity. Of course, we are going to much higher discharge temperatures and that is not good thermodynamically. We will pay price for that. But because of that, we will have a better performance of the, of the gas cooler. And I'll tell you in a second. So why is that so? When we look into thermophysical properties, this is very difficult to follow in the table, but just, just look in, with, be with me here and look, for instance, liquid specific heat is uh, significantly higher. That is why we, we, will, we will pay the price in expansion. But when you look into uh, density ratio, it is very small and the density of a vapor is very high. That means that uh, we can go to much smaller diameter of a tube in a CO2 system. And then the pressure drop will affect, uh, uh, um, when we look into slope of saturation pressure curve, this is much higher. So pressure drop will affect CO2 significantly less than other refrigerants. And uh, surface tension is very low, significantly lower than other refrigerants. And that means that the heat transfer due to easier nucleation in evaporator will be, will be significantly better. Now I mentioned something about the condenser uh, or gas cooler, how much better performance it is. So this is what we have like with 134A or other fluids. And this is what we get 
in uh, uh, CO2. And I will show you how what, have we really made that to be, uh, to be uh, uh, successful. This here is a measurement of one counterflow microchannel heat exchanger. And then we can measure the, uh, the inlet after the first uh, uh, slab, after the second or third slab. This is the inlet, the three locations at the header. And this is after the first, uh, um, after the first slab. So uh, what we see here is that uh, most of the job has been done in only third of a heat exchanger, which is identical as a condenser. Two other slabs give us a not too much of cooling. In other words, we can think about some other ways of reducing the cost by doing um, smaller and uh, more uh, uh, effective uh, gas cooler. How we did it is just to show you the, I'm just showing you the illustration. Uh, and I end this here, reduction of going uh, more to the left side that is shown uh, in this diagram. Basically, when we uh, go to the left side, only two degrees C, we are gaining something like 11%. So that means something like five and a half percent for only one degree C uh, more of cooling or effectiveness of the heat exchanger or reduction in approach temperature difference. Compressors are more efficient uh, and what to do, people didn't believe in that. Some people, I am now rushing a little bit because we are almost five minutes over the time. Some people, I hope, had listened to what I was telling, had made the uh, compressor without suction valves for 134A. Based on, the, on that story, how major a uh, uh, difference between uh, the fluids like CO2 and conventional refrigerant is in compressor in pressure drop over the suction valves. And they have designed a compressor that uh, has uh, no uh, suction valves with excellent uh, performance. Um, so basically opportunities for carbon dioxide right now at a lower temperature application, refrigeration, industrial and commercial, as uh, Bob was uh, saying, down to minus uh, 55 low ambient uh, 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 heat pumps and, uh, and so on. Work that is needed, pressure tolerant designs, uh, more efficient compressor expanders, injectors, anything that would improve left side. And when we talk about uh, uh, flammable refrigerants, I will just list them here. Propane has in my mind the greatest uh, commercial opportunity. The problem is that uh, this one is B3, uh, A3, sorry. Uh, that means it is very flammable. So the, 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 the charges are limited uh, uh, 250 grams. Now going to 300, some people are pushing to 500 grams. We'll see where would that be. Isobutane is uh, uh, good for some niche application where it had replaced uh, uh, R12 in the residential applications. And the same as Bob had listed, ethane, propane, and ethylene are uh, refrigerants that are good for lower temperature and the lower temperature applications are going from top to bottom uh, with ethane being kind of uh, the, the most, uh, uh, the, the lowest uh, uh, refrigerants here at minus uh, 160 degrees C uh, boiling point. What is the situation? Very good moment, uh, kind of uh, in more ecologically conscious society. That means whenever you say natural, it is like whenever somebody said it is uh, organic. Uh, it, it, it has a positive connotation for good or for uh, bad. Difficult to overcome initial high cost of equipment, requires many changes in conventional approaches in hardware. Mechanical engineers prefer easier approaches, less costly, less risky. And uh, uh, typically mechanical engineers uh, expect miracles from chemical engineers who had shown phenomenally good, I think, uh, results of uh, their work. And I believe that mechanical engineers can also show what we know. Um, generally, uh, uh, had the natural refrigerants been easy to work with, they would become a mainstream earlier. 
but they haven't. We hope they will uh, expand their role uh, because it is, it is possible when we put a little bit more work in it. And general directions, reduce charge. Hydrocarbons are uh, typically to be very flammable. Ammonia is mildly toxic, mildly flammable. CO2 is very high pressure. So all of that is good to have a low charge in a system. So design systems for a low charge work on heat exchanger modification, improve expansion processes. What is good is uh, just the last chart here is this is kind of a diagram that is showing uh, potential for charge reduction. Uh, this here is hydraulic diameter of, uh, of um, uh, microchannel uh, tube at uh, two kilowatt condenser. And what we see here that uh, really CO2 can work in the smallest hydraulic diameter and uh, uh, ammonia, uh, maybe not that small, but, uh, but has a greater, greatest potential for charge reduction. These are the flammable uh, refrigerants. So basically these refrigerants are performing much better than these in uh, low charge, uh, uh, low charge uh, situation. Um, uh, then why is that uh, this table shows that, but you can, you can look into that earlier. We need to, we need to uh, close our, our presentation and this is time uh, really for questions. So um, good, uh, good uh, talking to you. And I hope that we will see uh, many questions uh, to uh, strengthen our presentation. Thank you very much. So, First of all, uh, big thanks to both our speakers, Pega and uh, Bob, for this very interesting, you know, for these interesting presentations and, and ideas and thoughts uh, that you that you uh, informed us about. Um, I would also like to uh, remind our audience: um, please make use um, of the the question and answer uh, button on the, the the bottom of your screen um, to submit uh, questions. Uh, we are uh, open to taking your questions. Uh, we already start seeing uh, the first questions come in here. Um, and uh, we'll get started here in a, in a second. Um, I have uh, maybe the first one, very, very interesting question um, is um, where the situation um, of refrigerant leakage is compared um, to containment in nuclear reactors. So the participant is asking um, if the refrigerant leakage into the environment is the big concern why are we spending time and effort um, to redesign the refrigerant? Why do we not redesign the system to make these systems tight? And then it wouldn't matter basically what kind of refrigerant we are using. And uh, I would like to start uh, the question maybe for Pega. Okay, uh, just uh, I, I, I would also uh, give opportunity to, to Bob later, but I would say, would it, wouldn't it be nice in a nuclear reactor so not to worry about where we will dispose the uh, use the uh, nuclear fuel. Uh, whatever we put, whatever refrigerant we put in the in the systems, eventually will go out of the system. Yes, we need to reduce the leakage. That is very important. But eventually, everything that was uh, uh, produced will will end up in nature. So that's why we. It is essential in my mind to to try not to uh, you uh, not, not to leak as much as possible. But it is not not so easy. It is not so easy. Everything will leak eventually. So, Bob, what is your take on this question? I agree. It would be great, and I think I said myself, that if we had lower leakage rates, there would be less of a concern about GWP refrigerant or other effects of refrigerants. But we we have to bear in mind that people design systems to budgets. The most uh, compression cycles have very high pressure ratios, and so you're using positive displacement machines, which send pulsing vibrations all through the system as they operate. And over a time, it might take months, it might take years, that will work on joints and cause some leaks. So I, I think there's far more awareness now. Good practice and regular maintenance in the supermarket sector, for example, shows that significant reductions in leaks can be achieved. Uh, and that's certainly a, a trend we all want to encourage to continue. But Will we design for no leaks? Possibly, probably not. I was also thinking there must be a cost uh, aspect yeah. of if you would. You know. You're into Pareto optimization. Exactly. I mean, would we still be able to afford a home air conditioner if containment yeah. is uh, the route to go? But anyway, very good question. 
Um, Bob, here's another one for you. Um, the question is, uh, can R1234ZE be a drop-in substitute for R134A in refrigeration? Uh, well, thermodynamically, 1234ZE or ZE, as I would say over here, is similar to 134A, but its volumetric capacity is about 15 to 20 percent lower. Its vapor pressure is basically 15 to 20 percent lower, and that drives the capacity. Thermodynamically, its ideal COP is actually very good. It's slightly better than 134A. If you think again, Pega's point, you have to think of the system engineering. 20 percent lower density means 40 percent higher pressure drop. And the pressure losses in a real cycle are quite often a significant part of the, the loss of Carnot efficiency. So dropping it in, yeah, it'll work, but it won't work as efficiently as you might hope. You, so you'd really want to redesign. It's non-flammable at room temperature. It becomes weakly flammable at about 40, 35 to 40 Celsius. So again, just from a safety engineering point, if you look at actually 15 or EN378, it's treated as flammable in those codes, and that would limit what you could legally do with it in building applications. But thermodynamically, it's a nice fluid. Thank you. Then uh, the next question. Oh, I see. Uh, th this one must be for Pega. I see it is uh, by Hope Lee. Uh, I should inform the audience uh, that is uh, one of Pega's former PhD students. And I see Hope is uh, using his opportunity to ask difficult questions to his uh, former professor now. Um, the question here is. Um, we all know that uh, in the transition process of um, the, the refrigerants um, to new alternatives, um, heat exchangers have to be uh, redesigned. And uh, we also see that uh, some of these uh, alternative refrigerants uh, are blends or will be blends. And uh, some researchers have reported that uh, the heat transfer of zeotropic mixtures are relatively low and that the temperature profiles in the heat exchangers are very different. And uh, the question is now, what are the difficulties really in designing heat exchangers for these mixtures today? And uh, what are possible solutions? So if we can get an update, and I would start with Pega, but give the same question to, to Bob, of course. Yes, and uh, Bob, uh, Bob's uh, PhD was, uh, was in that. You know, uh, let me start with this. Uh, cycle, like Lorentz cycle, is phenomenally good. Uh, it is uh, thermodynamically good. The problem is that, uh, uh, and we know that, that the heat transfer with uh, uh, zeotropic mixtures is not as good as we would like it to be. What is interesting is when you look into a uh, zeotropic mixture of two components, the heat transfer is some, somewhere in the middle of the, of the uh, composition, in the middle of a heat exchanger, is worse than the worst component of these two. Uh, so we know why that happens. It is because uh, we have a preferential either condensation or if there are evaporation of one component and you typically are left with the other component uh, to, uh, to, uh, to kind of uh, deal with uh, dwindling uh, delta Ts in the heat exchanger and very difficult to, to handle that. So what are the options? We need to think about something smart, trying to kind of get rid of uh, 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 liquid would be, would be good to think about something like Kalina uh, process where we would, we would uh, have a larger internal heat exchangers and try to, to work with that. Uh, these are, the, these are the, the, the options to handle it. Um, is it uh, really necessary to uh, redesign the heat exchanger? No, you can, you can just extensively solve the problem, increase the size of the heat exchanger. But then the problem is that it becomes clumsy, big and expensive. So the moment when we, are, we start to optimize the system because uh, we want to have a system that will be competitive uh, on the market with, with other, other approaches, other refrigerants uh, in the similar systems, then this is uh, an opportunity. It is difficulty, but it is an opportunity for smart people as, uh, as Hope and many, many, many other uh, out. And I will stop here. Uh, Bob. Yes, well, yes, uh, as Peggy said, if you look at the typical film coefficients measured in heat transfer experiments of zeotropic mixtures, uh, you can see the film coefficient being lower than the calculated one you would get if you just took these properties of the mixture and stuck them into the dis built equation or whatever. But you have to remember there's two sides to every heat transfer story. Uh, if you have a, a extended surface heat exchanger with air on one side and refrigerant on the other side, then actually, the, yes, the film coefficient reduction might not translate to a huge reduction in practical overall heat transfer coefficient, and people often forget that. 
But be that as it may, it's also down to the degree of mixing and turbulence you can induce on the heat transfer surface. Uh, if you can induce a high degree of internal mixing and use maybe some tricks like a rifle bore tubing inside and so on to swirl and remix the liquid layer, you can mitigate this uh, re diffusion resistance to some extent. We actually converted one of our processed refrigeration units on the R134A plant in the UK back in the 1990s to a zeotropic mixture R407A, and that was a flooded evaporator refrigeration system. So possibly one of the worst geometries you could, could think of for a zeotropic mixture. People confidently assert even today that you can't use zeotropic mixtures in such configurations. Well, we converted it from R22, and we ran it for 20 years at minus 32 Celsius and 250 kilowatts. And as best we could tell, the heat transfer was actually slightly better with the blend than it was with 22. Uh, now that's doing industrial scale measurements with thermocouples and so on, but essentially why? Because it was boiling vigorously and the boiling effect was mitigating the mass transfer resistance from the zeotropic refrigerant effect. So it, it, it does occur, it's known, and if you go to labs like Pegas, you can accurately study it, but you can mitigate. Okay, thank you. Um, there were a couple of questions on uh, some fluids uh, that were not specifically mentioned or discussed, and I give two examples. Um, have you, for example, looked at ethers such as uh, DME? And an earlier question was, uh, what about water as a refrigerant? So maybe we start uh, with Pega. Okay, uh, water as a refrigerant is, uh, first of all, excellent, excellent fluid. It cannot be anything uh, better than that, even if you start swimming in, in a lot of refrigerant like that, you can drown. So that could be also very dangerous if you don't know how to swim. But in principle, for uh, uh, if we talk seriously, it is, uh, it is very safe refrigerant. Nevertheless, if we want to have any re good refrigeration effect, we need to go to uh, low pressures. Because if we want to go to lower temperature, we need to go to vacuum. Going to vacuum requires, uh, then we will have our refrigerant that has a very uh, uh, low uh, vapor density. That means we need to have a huge uh, uh, displacement of the compressor. So that means either very big compressor or very high speed compressor. Uh, and, uh, and that is the major problem be besides uh, having uh, operating in the vacuum. And as, when you leak outside, that becomes an environmental problem but when you leak inside, that becomes a very big engineering problem because you may not have your refrigerant that, that you have started with, but you have a mixture of air uh, and uh, your refrigerant, which uh, 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 could, be, could be, yes, it is, it is still air, but that air that is coming in is changing the, 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 uh, the, the uh, composition with, with all impurities that is uh, bringing. Now, uh, having said that, there are some excellent, uh, excellent uh, developments that have been going on in Germany recently uh, with, uh, with a good uh, uh, development in uh, water as a refrigerant and air as a refrigerant. Nevertheless, uh, efficiencies are still lower, uh, uh, cost is still significantly higher. Uh, we are far from... Um, a viable, a commercially viable option. Uh, and uh, my, uh, my prediction is that it will be some time uh, before we, we get there. Uh, so um, that is good for, uh, uh, to, to continue researching in that uh, direction and improving design, uh, engineering design. Uh, there is nothing to improve in, in the refrigerant, but um, yeah. Then, then that is, uh, that is the, 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 the situation. Uh, so good alternative refrigerant, not very efficient solutions and uh, difficult to uh, be cost effective and, um, and uh, reasonable size for the capacity. Um, what about the ethers? I believe there have been some attempts to blend uh, DME yeah. with uh, ammonia. I, I think yeah. there was some work in the past. That was, that was that, and I think uh, maybe I don't need to take all of the time. Bob, maybe you can uh, chip in. Yes, I mean, DME has been looked at as a refrigerant, but it's an extremely flammable fluid. It, you know, in some respects, it's almost more flammable than a hydrocarbon because it has onboard oxygen. 
Uh, so that, that's a major challenge. People did look at fluorinated ethers in the late 1990s, and some of them do have the right sort of thermodynamic properties, but unfortunately the fluorination makes them almost as stable as HFCs and the global warming potentials are still measured in the high hundreds. Uh, I, that, that's pretty much it as far as current uh, refrigerant ether development is concerned. Okay, thanks. Um, here's an interesting question about uh, refrigerant disposal. Um, can we discuss uh, some pros and cons uh, about refrigerant disposal for these uh, various alternatives we are discussing today? And uh, Bob, I don't know if you sure. would like to continue. Sure. Yes, well, historically, refrigerants have been disposed of rather than recovered, typically, because when virgin refrigerant is relatively low cost, uh, people tend not to go to the expense of trying to reclaim refrigerant from mixtures. And actually, if you look at what comes back from a typical service engineer's recovery cylinder, he will not have 20 cylinders in his truck, he will have one. So you get a cocktail of fluids coming back with maybe azeotropes in there, charred remains of lubricating oil, bits of insulation foam, water, air. And it's just all, all you could sit down and design a chemical process for separation, purification, it would not be economically viable. Uh, so what typically tends to happen is they are incinerated. Uh, the uh, recovery, however, does become more attractive if you are in a regulated market, for example, the European Union, where uh, bans were introduced on new refrigerant into supermarket systems, for example, uh, but so suddenly the existing refrigerant charge was a significant portion of the requirements for a supermarket chain and they would pay and invest in safe recovery and put much more emphasis on recovery to the technicians. So I think, you know, chem as chem Pega mentioned, chemical engineers can solve most separation and recovery challenges given sufficient economic driver to do so. And the, the key to uh, in encouraging recovery is to make sure that people understand it's a good thing to do, the right thing to do, and it's rewarding. Then it can be done. Um, Pega, would you like to add uh, something to this discussion? Um, then Pega, here's one for you, something on microchannels. Um, how important is the development of low-cost uh, microchannel heat exchanger to the adaptation of refrigerants like CO2 and ammonia and what is being done in that space? I think it is extremely important. Uh, a lot of uh, things could be done. There are uh, various uh, designs of microchannel heat exchangers, uh, not only microchannel heat exchangers for um, uh, exchange with air, heat exchange with air, but uh, heat exchange with uh, other uh, refrigerants like water, glycol, or or something like that. Secondary refrigerants. Uh, uh, it is uh, there is a no uh, in my mind. There is a no uh, no design that is final. Uh, uh, so I think that we need uh, to to look for other designs that are that are smart, that are good, that are uh, lower cost and simple. Now, uh, we when we talk about low cost and uh, microchannel uh, heat exchangers, there are various issues that needs to be solved in parallel with the reduction of the cost. These are number one is distribution of two phase refrigerants. Uh, relatively equally among the channels, and not even necessarily equally, appropriately to the micro channels. Uh, that is a very big problem. So those of you who are interested in solving the, the crucial problems is to think about how to handle distribution of two-phase flow in microchannel heat exchangers. That is number one. Number two, if you have air uh, on the other side, it is frosting, defrosting, and how long can one uh, uh, heat exchanger work in frosting condition, especially now, as Bob mentioned, how, uh, uh, let's say, electric cars are now, when electric cars are coming to the market, there is a huge need for improving uh, uh, heat pump operation of the, of the thermal system. So far, air conditioning systems in the car. And one of the issues is in microchannel heat exchangers is how to operate long enough, in other words, how to handle the, the fouling uh, uh, frost outside of the microchannel heat exchanger. Uh, designing the, the, the system is, all, the, 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 the heat exchanger is also very, very important, but uh, these should be, the design should always look into distribution and, uh, and the fouling issues 
mostly frost as a founding uh, agent. Thank you, Pega. Um, Bob, uh, I have one, one for you here. Um, mm -hmm. uh, we're getting a question. We're interested in measurements of HFO's uh, thermophysical properties, but we have yeah. difficulties uh, getting samples of various uh, fluids. Can you suggest a way of getting these samples? Since you work in chemical industry, I thought, Bob, you were the, the, the person to ask. Send me an email, Sergio. We'll see what we can do. <laughs> no, right. no, we, 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 we will try to support uh, academic measurements of properties where we can. Uh, I, you know, when I did my PhD, ICI supported me with refrigerant samples, and you know we're trying to continue that policy. Great, thank you, Bob. Um, then a uh, question here from Bill Hill. Um, he's uh, observing that there is way too many refrigerant uh, options um, in different uh, parts of the world for the various applications. And is there any way in reducing that kind of variety of refrigerants? In other words, are maybe some of these new options allowing for wider operating range, thereby you know, we could uh, reduce um, the, the number of candidates that are being discussed? And maybe Pega, if you would like to start. I, uh, yeah, uh, hi, Bill. Uh, I don't think uh, we will see that soon. The major problem is uh, now in uh, kind of uh, medium pressure, uh, medium temperature applications, and that is for air conditioning, where uh, uh, a new low GW, where we don't have a good candidate for low GWP uh, uh, fluid uh, uh, as a single component. So the moment when we start uh, work, but, but this is maybe also a very good uh, uh, question for Bob. When we start working with mixtures, then the same as, uh, as a good mechanical engineering that I could imagine good chemical engineer is uh, now having uh, uh, opportunities to find a good blend that will have a decent, uh, decent uh, properties. Uh, and I don't think, uh, I don't see uh, we will stop that uh, um, soon uh, because uh, at this point I don't see a good uh, good uh, uh, good candidate when we exclude let's say 32 uh, because of uh, relatively high GWP uh, many people don't think that CO2 could uh, jump into that uh, role that uh, uh, propane is not good because of that flammability by the way I would uh, I would uh, respectfully maybe, disagree that uh, CO2 cannot do that. It can do it maybe at a little bit more cost. These are the things, but I, I would, I would uh, kind of uh, leave to Bob to say what he thinks about whether we will see soon uh, a reduction of number of refrigerant, especially refrigerant mixtures uh, uh, for specifically that, uh, that application or others too. Yeah, I think we're in right now, I say we're in a divergent phase. Back in the 1990s, we had a similar divergent phase. And if you look at the huge shopping list of R numbers in ASHRAE standard 34, many of them were introduced and then just quietly fell by the wayside as people coalesced on rationalizing down to pure fluids. I think we'll see some application sectors will coalesce around a single solution and go, well, that's, that's fine for now. Uh, and a good example of that, for example, is the replacement R404A, GWP 4000 in transport air refrigeration systems uh, with R452A, where that's a good option. It halves the GWP and it's non-flammable and it keeps the compressor cool, which is one of the key technical challenges for that application. So there's no real driver for other chemical companies to offer slightly better alternatives. It won't, it won't make a significant environmental difference. Uh, to that to that application, so innovation in that field is probably not going so fast. But Pega's point about residential aircon, how do you get the GWP down? That uh, people will have to look at blends. So there'll be a period of several blends being evaluated, and then probably the industry will quietly coalesce around one that's good enough in in the future. In other areas, you will see there may be an enduring uh, situation where one refrigerant is placed by two or three. We are seeing this, for example, I mentioned the very low temperature area where we're developing alternatives for the high GWP fluids R23 and R508. You can segment the application range that the R23 is used in from minus 90 up to minus 60. Uh, if you only need to go to minus 60, minus 70 evaporator, you don't need to use the same fluid as you would do to, if you want to go to minus 90 and stay non flammable and by incorporating CO2 in that fluid, when we're inherently limiting how much CO2 we can use by the application temperature. So you could see that 
single sector GWP 15,000 going to maybe two blinds, one below 2,000, one below 3,000. Uh, and that, that way you minimize the environmental emission overall, but you, you do then have to use two fluids. Uh, so I, I think we will see people trying ideas out. Some big applications will probably coalesce around fewer numbers uh, and then we'll all settle down again. If I may add only one thing, uh, um, Bill, if you think about now, uh, even hardware is not uh, uh, defined, for instance, for uh, uh, heat pumps for electric cars. Uh, as many manufacturers out, that many uh, architecture approaches for the system uh, for the heat pump. So it is very difficult to expect that we see uh, less refrigerant options if we have that many hardware options, even for one hardware option, we, we should have a various uh, refrigerant options uh, for optimization and uh, kind of uh, in that direction. So just wanted to add to that uh, uh, question that we will, we will see, and I think it is good. It is maybe not good for the industry, but it is good for engineers to, to try to work on optimization in every, in every respect, optimization of a hardware and optimization of a, of a refrigerant and trying to mix these two together for uh, trying to get to some meaningful uh, solution. That's thanks. Um, I look at the, the clock. I think we still have a few minutes, so we can take a few more questions. Um, there is a little bit of confusion of uh, the term around the term low GWP and what it really means. Um, so how low is low and how low do we need? Um, and will we keep replacing refrigerants until we are down to one? So I don't know, Bob. Yeah, why not? Oh. Uh, that is one way in my mind to to think about that. There is a no uh, no uh, uh, no no lo lower than than we can go. Uh, and the reason why we have that many thresholds is because uh, it is so difficult to find a good uh, feasible and in engineering point of view. Uh, 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 good systems that will work with uh, with refrigerant with low GWP at that particular application to find them so quickly and, uh, and reduce uh, 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 GWP or the refrigerants. So, uh, but that number, the threshold is going down over time for every application, uh, making it as, as soon as chemical engineers, as maybe Bob can, can add there, as soon as chemical engineers are uh, finding some good solution or when mechanical engineers demonstrate uh, that there is a feasible way, feasible meaning uh, relatively low cost way uh, to handle the, the, the problem, uh, then the threshold is going down. Now, uh, there, 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 there is a problem with the kind of incentivization of the engineering uh, and the companies to find a solution for a lower GWP uh, uh, systems in, in refrigerants that go with that. Um, and, uh, and that is being done. Uh, a little bit of incentivization from, uh, from the, 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 the countries, from the regulating agencies and so on. And I will stop here. Maybe ask for Bob's opinion on, on this question. Yeah. How low is low? Yes. I, again, I think I made the point before that some applications need GWP, which is code for fluorine for heat capacity, to, you know, just to let the mechanical exigencies of the compressor be mitigated. Uh, if you look at what the best example for regulation is going to take us is, it's the Montreal Protocol, specifically the Kigali Amendment. You can take the phase down schedule mandated in that, which you know, I think America is going to be signing back up to, uh, and you can calculate over time what the average GWP of refrigerant in the global market it needs to be to comply with the Montreal Protocol. Uh, the answer is about 300 GWP. Uh, now, the biggest single use of refrigerant today by volume is residential air conditioning, which right now the incumbent R410A GWP is 2100. It's been replaced in Europe and it will come soon in America by R32, which is GWP 675. And for small systems, and we may see some of this, especially in India and Asia, by propane for window box, one kilowatt to three kilowatt type cooling units, uh, where the charge size can then be small enough to, to be safely dealt with. Uh, but, this... but the use of protein is still growing in the developing economies. And so if you say, well, by 2030, 
we need the average overall application to be 300. That's going to push pressure down on GWP in sectors that can take it. So I think we will see a downward pressure, but there is a realisation that there are some technical needs that say you do have to use some fluorinated refrigerants in some situations. Uh, thanks, Bob. And that fits very well to another question I see here. Um, and uh, the participant is asking, a handful of companies in Europe and Asia use uh, R290 propane for residential applications. And while it's very flammable, um, there's very low incidence um, of explosions, no reports of fires, nothing like that. Um, do we see a way of uh, introducing this technology in North America? Maybe, Pega? I'm not the expert with that, but my my sense is no. I don't think we will we will see that in North America soon, uh, because uh, because of type of society and uh, and quite frankly, a uh, more 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 uh, a litigious uh, society. And uh, I, I don't think that we will see propane in air conditioning uh, soon. Uh, I would just like to uh, mention that at CTS we have uh, uh, done uh, 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 with 150 grams uh, over seven, eight kilowatt uh, refrigeration systems, but these are very special. But uh, the problem that I see for in all of these Asian uh, systems is that they are in generally people in, in, uh, in uh, who, who are kind of pushing flammable refrigerants like, uh, like propane is that they are trying only to push for larger charges from 150 grams to 300 to 500, even kilo, kilo and a half. And uh, why they are doing that? Because it is cheaper to get uh, okay from uh, regulators, from legislators to use a larger charges instead of going into trying to find a solution to get uh, more capacity with the smaller or lower charges than, than, uh, than it could be done. And I think, again, this is more a uh, matter of mechanical engineers and, uh, and um, money that companies are ready to put into development of a very low charge system. It is possible. But when you have a system that is of a split nature, like a condensing unit is separate from evaporator, and we have unknown amount of uh, refrigerant in the connecting uh, piping. It is very difficult for me to see that it will be it will be um, uh, accepted soon. And the fact that uh, maybe uh, the the person who had asked that question doesn't know for the for the accident, I could tell that to that person and others that we know that there have been many accidents. And uh, we typically see the, 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 the suppression of information in the cases of these uh, accidents uh, for logical reasons. You know, people don't, don't like to, 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 uh, to, to publicize the, the, the problems with the flammability. So uh, yeah, and I will stop there, I should. Okay. I think we can take maybe one or two more questions. Um, so here's one um, due to the current uh, situation. I think uh, many people uh, have something like this in mind. Um, we hear a lot about um, uh, vaccine storage, cold storage um, at these very low temperatures. Um, are there any specific refrigerants for that? Are there any alternatives in that range? Um, you know, what, what are the requirements um, that a refrigerant would have to meet uh, for these ultra low uh, refrigerants, uh, ultra low temperature refrigerants? And I think Bob had uh, already okay. mentioned a little bit in his presentation, so maybe he can elaborate a little bit more. Yes, well, I, I am trying to be giving you an objective overview of what's going on rather than plug our own R&D efforts, but uh, I can't really resist that kind of open goal, so I'll go for it. Uh, Right now, the, the two main refrigerants used for very, very low temperature refrigeration for small systems, biomed freezers and so on. Uh, some people are now using ethane in the bottom stage. These, these applications, you almost need a cascade. You need two systems linked. So you, you have minus 80 to minus 30 and then minus 35 to ambient air in the two cycles. So for small systems, people can use ethane, although it does run the compressor very hot. So that gives some challenges or they use R23 or R508. And those two gases both have a global warming potential in the range 13 to 14,000. Uh, 
larger systems, flammability considerations precludes 18 and then 508 or 23 would universally be used. Right now, today, every Pfizer va vaccine will be refrigerated with one of those two options, ethane or the, the high GDP fluorocarbons. Uh, the, the developments we are doing, we're, we're looking at uh, alternatives for 23, so non flammable fluids. And you know, we've got one where the GDP is about 1800. Uh, it's limited by its CO2 content to running to around about minus 70, minus 75 Celsius evaporation, maybe. So that's just above the triple point of CO2. Uh, if we then look at uh, what we can do, we can certainly get it colder and we'll be able to get further GDP reduction, but it won't drop into systems. Biomed freezers are part of a pharma supply chain, so equipment needs to be validated in the same way that uh, uh, other parts of the medical industry would undergo validation. So it won't be tomorrow, but if there's an enduring need for a pharma cold chain at minus 80 to keep the world safely vaccinated through coming years, then you know, I can guarantee people will want to know more about refrigerant options for that space. Thank you. Pega, anything you would like to add? Uh, I would 100% uh, agree with uh, what Bob had said. And I would maybe add, uh, uh, um, we, we, we can make the systems. With the, the problem with the, these uh, applications, very low temperature, uh, and, uh, until now, when, uh, when it exploded with uh, everybody's uh, uh, mind focus on, on COVID and vaccines and low temperatures and all of that. Uh, uh, these options exist, uh, but uh, there have been a no, the, 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 uh, the market is very small to support a, a, a really in-depth uh, uh, rebuild of the system. So now hopefully things will, will change with, uh, with the pressure from uh, um, vaccine uh, issue. Thank you. Um, I think it's about time to, to wrap up our, our discussion here. And uh, let me thank again uh, both of our speakers for uh, their great presentation and uh, the, the information uh, they conveyed to us. Um, let me also um, show you um, the advertisement for the next um, InnoTherm Colloquium, which will take place on uh, March 3rd, um, featuring Professor uh, Srinivas Garimela uh, on sorption technologies for space conditioning thermal storage and uh, carbon capture. And um, um, please type in uh, your suggestions and uh, topics. So uh, MIT would like to know um, about your input here. And uh, you're also encouraged, of course, to sign up for the, the email list. Um, as for the questions today, I think we were able to get to almost all of them. Maybe there were a handful um, we, we were not able to address because of timing. I believe those questions um, will also be uh, posted. Um, later together with the recording. So there is um, still some time later to, to think about those. So with that, uh, I would like to conclude our, our seminar today and uh, thank all of the participants for attending. And uh, thank you very much and uh, have a nice day. Goodbye. Thank you.